T-Bro in the morning, Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Our friend Soumya Krishnamurthy is on the program because she wrote a book called Fashion Killer, How Hip-Hop Revolutionized High Fashion. Soumya, good morning. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for joining. We're great. We're chilling, you know. Um, I, This book uh, seems like a no-brainer, but I we were just talking before this interview, uh, and I see one of your tweets here. It says, uh, for all my creatives, tell the stories you want to tell. 99% of people passed on Fashion Killer. They didn't get the vision. They didn't think the history was important or deserved to be d- documented mm. in a book. They were wrong. Keep going. Uh, would love to hear about that journey a little bit more. Why does that tweet make me sound like I'm DJ Khaled? <laughs> yeah, they no, don't believe the you. I, they don't want you to put they out a book. You to prov- they don't want you to prosper. So they you really know what I did? Don't... I put out a book. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because... So the process of this started three years ago. um, And this was, I already kind of knew Hip Hop 50 was coming around the corner. So for my first book, I wanted to tell an important story, but a story that hadn't been told. So when you think of hip hop and fashion, usually it's through this kind of surface level lens. So it's the artists and what they wore and a bunch of pretty pictures, which of course this book has, but I wanted to go deeper into the history and the backstory into the culture and all of these important things. And most publishers actually passed on this book. It's Mm. funny, we've been getting amazing press. The critics love this book, but at the time I got so many no's because you know, I hate to say it in the literary world, hip hop is still viewed very niche. And for me, one of my goals as a writer is to elevate hip hop and to give it that same reverence and respect that we see other music genres getting as well as other art. I love that. It's so important because just a couple of years ago, we saw how social media really rallied around Dapper Dan, right? When Gucci was basically ripping off designs that he had in the 80s that's right how and dare they rip him off after he ripped them off to rip them off y'all gonna give him some props he ripped them off to rip them off to rip them off but with yeah. his original designs though you know that's what i right. mean that's right yeah and it's funny because dan says that that really without twitter and he shouts out black twitter specifically he's like i wouldn't be here because originally gucci gave him sort of this like instagram apology and twitter rallied hard and said no you have to give him props and pay him and then they realized we actually need to partner with him so it shouldn't get to the point of social media outrage but sometimes it has to in your book Salmia, it looks like you start there because the chapter one is across 125th street so heavy harlem right there and chapter two is luxury law so i'm feeling like and i haven't cracked the book yet um but i'm feeling like you kind of get into those things in the beginning yeah so ebro's the guy who didn't do the reading before the assignment was right okay because in school, I was always the one who did everyone's group project. So no, no worries. And I was and I was always the guy that act like I knew what was going on in class to get try to get extra credit because I knew it. Nice. Teachers. Some people some teachers. people would argue you're still that guy pretending to no, know no, what's no. going on today. On the That's radio. exactly my point. Well, I would, I would um, sign it, but, but I guess in this group project, I'll be the nerd. I'll be the valedictorian. <laughs> And yeah, so I wanted to start, it starts with DAP in in Harlem, but I wanted to go even further back to talk about Harlem and why it's, I think, probably the flyest neighborhood. And I know I'm going to get a lot of a lot of heat for that. You have to go into the history, Harlem Renaissance, Black Migration, um, the Black Church, like all of these important cultural milestones and touchstones before we even get to Dapper Dan, because he is the successor of all those things. Um, The second chapter you mentioned is about the laws. And it was so important for me to go into why do we dress the way we dress? So it's the psychology. It's the fact that, you know, back in the day, you couldn't just wear what you wanted. If we go back into the ancient time or into Europe and later into colonial America, there were laws like based upon your stature, your race, like what you could wear and what you couldn't wear. Now, of course, when we go to the store now and pick out an outfit, we're not thinking about those things, but I wanted to show how deeper it is. It isn't just rappers like nice clothing or rappers are materialistic. Again, that's the surface level. Let's actually go deeper and go into the why, whether it's conscious or subconscious. Right, because there's rebellion in there. The rebellion of, of taking on clothes that you know weren't intended for your cultural group right. or your class. And that's so hip hop, right? Like to take things that, you know, already existed and then remix them, uh, represent them in a way that is, you know, um, you know, re- a reflection of your current 
st mind state or your current uh situation in society and 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 so this is like it's good timing i was talking to west side gun last night a, a, a lot about clothing which i never really spent that much time talking to him about and trying to get sort of what his perspective was when he first started showing up to paris and walking into stores and ending up at shows and things like that who do you track back to as the first artist to really start taking it to that level where they really became really serious about high-end clothing and getting involved in the game where does that begin it's interesting. Obviously, we go to the old school. We can't forget, you know, uh, Eric B and Rod Kim wearing Dapper Dan, Big Daddy Kane, who was very much into tailoring and suiting. But if we're going to look at the fashion industry, somebody who was embraced by the fashion industry very early, a surprising name is Tupac. So a lot of people don't remember right before he passed, Pac walked in a Versace show in Milan and he reportedly was someone who Gianni Versace, then, then the designer uh, of the house, felt very close to. They thought he was a very attractive, beautiful man. And again, right before he passed, he walked in this Versace show. Now, who would have known what would have happened had he lived? But Pac was somebody who played this very interesting role in fashion. He was very instrumental with people like Carl Kanai and April Walker, working mm. with them, wearing their clothes, appearing in ads for them. And then later to be this Versace darling kind of showed this full circle moment. So of course, names like Puffy, Pharrell, all of them come into play later. But one name that oftentimes we talk a lot about within the music and cultural context, but not fashion is Tupac. And I could have seen had he, had he lived that high fashion would have absolutely embraced him. You have a chapter called Bury Them in Low, and you're wearing a Ralph Lauren. I think that's a Ralph Lauren teddy that's bear. That's right. It is. Um, that relationship between, uh, you know, hip-hop and Ralph Lauren is is also uh, a very deep one, uh, and you delve into it in chapter four. Uh, where did you take it? So it's interesting because, of course, we know hip-hop has its pensions for Ralph Lauren, but I wanted to show this parallel of Ralph Lauren as this kind of an immigrant dream. And I think that's something a lot of artists resonated with. He's from New York. He's the child of immigrant parents and very much kind of pulled himself up by his bootstraps. And I think that resonates, right? The started from, from the bottom kind of ethos. When it comes to Ralph Lauren specifically, his designs were always what I would call the American dream. So these are people who go to the Hamptons in the summer, they go skiing in Aspen. I mean, for most of us, that world is completely foreign. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense in a way, if you wear the clothing, you feel somewhat close to it. You feel that you're part of this amplified, elevated American dream. One thing I wanted to make sure to shout out in this chapter are the lowlifes. So for those who don't know, this was a crew out of Brooklyn. They were boosting crew and they basically stole a bunch of Ralph Lauren, would wear it around Brooklyn. But they were very much kind of these early niche influencers because imagine all the people in their neighborhood and in Brownsville, et cetera, who saw them wearing polo from head to toe. Of course, we got to talk about artists like Ray Kwan with that famous um, snow beach jacket and, you know, all of these other great iconic moments. Kanye with the pink polo. There's so many great moments when it comes to Ralph Lauren. But I think this was a brand very early on that hip hop felt very close to and, and it resonated this idea of being part of a larger American dream. I'm sure you dove into the little Kim Foxy Brown era because to me, I would just remember seeing um, when designers were like in love with little Kim and, and finally saying yes. But also there's a Misa Hilton who was there who also has so many doors shut in front of her face, so many no's and how many times she was trying to, you know, as an image consultant at the time, because that's what she was, um, how she pushed forward and finally got the acceptance. Can you... Can, I'm sure you spoke to June Ambrose also, right? So one thing that was very important in this book was representation. <clears throat> a lot of times when we talk about hip hop stories, especially within a historical context, it's usually a male story told from the perspective of a man and kind of amplifying male figures. And of course, we can't forget the guys. But it was important to focus not just on the well-known women, so like Little Kim, Foxy, Eve, people like that, 
but also unsung. So some of the earliest fashion editors um, at the Source magazine, for example, Julia Chance and Sonia Maget, they were instrumental in amplifying someone like a Tyson Beckford, who was discovered in the pages of the Source. So well before Ralph Lauren, before he was the world's biggest male supermodel, Tyson was in the Source magazine, which a lot of people don't remember. Uh, when it comes to little Kim, I mean, what, what more can I say? She's someone who's such an unsung hero, where we, of course, think of her as a high fashion icon, but right. she never got the cover of American Vogue. She never got sort of her um, CFDA flowers. And I think it was very important to show from day one, this girl from Brooklyn who was just fearless and beautiful and uh, was a risk taker when it came to her fashion and her style. And that is something high fashion very much gravitated towards. What's interesting is I've been talking to people for this book. A lot of people have been wondering, should the fashion industry do something to give Kim her flowers now? Does that mean a cover? Does it mean some sort of CFDA lifetime award? And I think absolutely. Not only did she yes. birth a generation of female artists after her, but so many fashionistas and designers continue to pull from her as, as an inspiration and muse. Rosenberg, do you know what CFDA is? Yeah. No. Oh, me either. Laura, you want to tell me what is it's CFDA? It's the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Oh, I knew Laura would know. Yeah. See, she was oh. also the one who did the reading for the book report. No, she, she didn't. So no, she's didn't. a hype beast, just like she the rest just knows. Of she's no, just a hype beast, bro. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. <laughs> now, I Samia, I want to give you your props, too, because you've been uh, contributing to this hip hop thing in an amazing way, writing and just being a part of amazingness. And I would love, you know, how did you land at writing this book? Like you you've written so much and contributed so much to hip hop through writing and just, you know, listening to music and being a part of just the culture here in the industry in New York. But I want to know how you landed at writing this book. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very much kind of a career in the making. And funny story, and Ebro, you don't know this. One of the first industry people I met when I first moved to New York was Ebro. He definitely doesn't oh, remember hey. this. It was me, Ebro, and a third executive. We went out for sushi. I didn't know how to eat sushi, so I just kind of stabbed it for the night and then ended up going <laughs> home eating a sandwich. So that was a long time ago. I know how to eat sushi now. Um, so basically, I mean, I've been in the industry for 15 years. I think right. I've, I've officially hit that OG status. And as a writer, full-time writer for you know 12 plus years, I've been able to interview some of the biggest artists um, for, you know, Double XL and The Source and Billboard, Rolling Stone and Playboy and all these places. But for me, it was important at a time in my career to write something that really felt like a contribution and felt something that I could have true ownership of creatively guiding that vision. And for me, you know, having a book is so important because, again, it documents these stories. And oftentimes we talk about in hip hop media, so many of the media we grew up loving doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. or doesn't exist in the way that we we remember, you know, getting a magazine every month or being able to easily access these things. And I think as hip hop is 50 and gets older and older, these stories have to be documented. And I think, you know, it needs to be told with people who have the passion and the heart for the culture and also want to make that positive contribution. For me, telling these hip hop stories in this sort of elevated way through a prestige lens is really important. So for me, as I embarked on my first book project, it had to be a book that took this subject matter to that next level. So whether it's in the writing, the photos inside, or even the cover, I wanted to make sure it looked luxe, it looked special, it looked like a luxury product, because to me, that's what the art needs to feel like, like it's art and it belongs in museums and libraries and on bookshelves. I love you saying that because I think when we started this conversation, you made mention of people uh, who still just see hip hop as this, uh, as a sidebar, as yep. influential as it's, as it is. And it's, and it's easy for them to do that because we live in a society where, you know, black and brown people are often the sidebar. They're not wanting, you know, they don't want to give the marquee away. They don't want to give the, the credibility and the influence to you know to the cultures and and the things that come from the small communities that are the oppressed and marginalized and so i appreciate you wanting to contribute in that way i think it's very important and thank yeah. you for that 
Of course. And, you know, it's funny because I've been looking at sort of the Amazon charts, which um, to see the, this book sales. And at any given moment, I'm the only woman on the charts. It's like, wow. I think right now it's like me and young Jeezy because he dropped his memoir. So Jeezy, you're one of my favorite rappers. But right now there's there's no love in book sales. That's right. You got to take out the snowman. You got to take him out. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's also important for me from a representation perspective having more women, women of color, to be able to write these stories. Again, the lit world is still even behind the scenes. It is very male. And oftentimes the people telling these stories come from the ivory tower and have really um, impressive degrees and work for what we call capital J journalism. But I think it's important for everyone to have a seat at that table. And for me, Part of this book is hopefully the success to open up opportunities for other women writers. Like I want more of us to be on these charts. It, it can't just be me and Young Jeezy. There have to be more. And you know, the success of this book and other books like this, I think, help open those doors. Um, where do you see fashion headed when you look at the when you look at the young uh, hip hop scene today? The new artists. Are you seeing any cyclical trends from you know the past representing itself today? Are you seeing uh, new things? W what's happening in your view? So it's interesting because I think in the late 90s and early aughts, which is personally my favorite era, we saw so many rapper led brands. But now we're in an era more of collaboration. Pharrell at Louis Vuitton, for example, or, you know, ASAP Rocky, all these artists who are working with established brands. I think now in many ways, merch has sort of replaced what the rapper clothing brands are. And I think mm. I saw Wilsonberg. You are you wearing Tyler? I don't know if I could see it right through the Call screen. Call me if you get lost. Yeah. Yeah. See, so it's this idea of merch kind of turning into what used to be like, you know, Eminem's clothing line or Wu right. Wei, anything of that nature. I think in the future, based upon, you know, what Pharrell decides to do, that really is creating a new blueprint. I could see more artists who are really serious about fashion, like the ASAP Rockies of the world, the Pusha T's of the world, following in that vein and maybe taking on these creative director roles. Um, but selfishly, I would love to see more artists, designers, visionaries from hip hop have their own brands. I think it's so important to really have skin in the game. And I would love a, a hip hop brand to be the next big American heritage brand, the next big polo, the next big Tommy Hilfiger. I would love to see an artist brand outlive the artist's music career. That to me would be the ultimate test. Her name is Somia Krishna Murth Murthy, and her uh, book Fashion Killer is available everywhere. Go pick it up. It's definitely one of those books. Like, I have several books around the house that, you know, you just want to have, like, in your hip-hop collection of books of, you know, that you have around the house that you could thumb through with your family and kids and remember certain times in history and learn a little something. Somia, thank you for your time today. Thank you. And the thank cover of the book is in a selfie. So whether you read the book or not, <laughs> I throw it up. It's really good in your. It's in your a great selfie book, <laughs> and you could pose like you actually read, which we know a lot of people don't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's all right. It's a group project out of A. You're all good, bro. <laughs> <laughs>